Hi. Hi. My name is Jasmine. Nice to meet you. Jasmine, it's nice to meet you too. So we're here. I got a couple questions for you today. Okay. You know, a couple of my peers, we want to know a couple of more things about the state epidemiologist. Of course. All right. So just first off, let me introduce myself. I go to Ridgeview High School, and I'm the student body president there. Okay. That's yeah. impressive. All right. So just quick question. You know, it's the silliest question, of course. Could you, if you, let's hear from a professional, explain a little bit more about the COVID-19, how it affects the body system, how it's spread? No, I would like to hear from a professional, yeah. Okay. Well, the, um, the, the virus that causes the disease, COVID-19, is called the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which means it's, the, it's sort of the second version of a virus that previously caused a pandemic. And, and we call it a novel virus because just a little over, it's been just about a year now that uh, a year ago that we identified the first cases in the United States. <clears throat> and this novel virus is novel in a lot of ways. And we call it novel because it's a new virus, hasn't been recognized before. But your question about how it affects the body is really the most fascinating thing about this virus because we, um, explain to people that it's a respiratory virus. That means it's spread from person to person by respiratory droplets. And uh, what we originally thought was that it would primarily affect the lungs. But the really interesting and novel thing about this virus is that it has the ability to attach to almost, to attach to the tissues in almost any organ system in the body. So what we're seeing is that it causes not only symptoms like um, fever, body aches, muscle aches, but it can have complications in nearly every system. It can cause gastrointestinal symptoms, it can affect the nervous system. In addition to the lungs, it can affect the kidneys, um, it can affect the brain, it can affect the heart, uh, it can cause rashes. So this is a virus that uh, we're learning can cause complications in almost every organ system of the body. And even unexpected things like one of the um, unique presenting symptoms is that it can take away your sense of taste or smell. And in some people, those symptoms resolve quickly. Some people have um, a prolonged period of recovery. They may feel weak, uh, not back to their baseline for some time. But um, many, many people have no symptoms at all. So we believe at, at least 40% or more of the people have no symptoms, but this is a concern because they can still spread the virus even though they don't appear to be ill. Sure. Okay. And so we've been in about this pandemic for about a year and a half, so to say. About a year. About a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I understand that a vaccine has recently come out, and I understand you have taken this, the first dose of the vaccine, right? That's right. All right. So can you explain a little bit more about the dosages of the vaccine? Because I remember it's like two or three, right? Two, two, two doses, right. Um, I was really excited to be able to get the vaccine. And a lot of people were asking questions about the vaccine. Yes. Is it safe? Should I get it? And um, because I understand how successful vaccines have been in general, in fact, their vaccines are among one of the single most successful public health interventions in history, making vaccine preventable diseases go away. So I was really excited to get the vaccine. And currently there are two vaccines that are available, two different products that have been approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration. And they both have been shown to have a very equal safety profiles in terms of not causing any um, really serious um, adverse events or serious side effects. And um, they're both very effective, both effective in about uh, not at, a, at, a, at a range of about 95% in preventing severe illness. They must both be given as what we call a two-dose series. Uh, you have to get one dose and then wait either three or four weeks to get the second dose. And it's that second dose that gives the maximum effectiveness of immunity. That it's, it's getting that second dose is where we get to the 95% protection against um, severe illness. And so there, in, in many respects, both of those vaccines are about the same in safety, effectiveness, two-dose series. Um, we're looking forward to the introduction of, of more vaccines, and we hope that comes soon. All right. Okay. So we know you're a state epidemiologist, but, you know, I heard that you used to be into marine biology at the University of Texas. Yeah. How, did, how did we get from there to South Carolina? 
I'm really surprised that you know that piece of information, but that, that's and true. Stalker, and, yeah. and I think this is a great message for young people who are, who are trying to think about their careers. I was, I was always interested in biology. Um, I grew up in, the, in Texas, in the middle of a desert, so I, my family rarely got to travel to the coast to go to the ocean. So we wanted some water. Yeah. So marine biology is what I thought I wanted to do. Um, that was my first major in college. That was my major for about six months. <laughs> and when I talked to the first career counselor when I got to college, they said, you know, careers in marine biology are sort of limited, and you might want to broaden your interest a little bit. I was encouraged to go into molecular biology. I will say that marine biology is a much broader field now, that they have lots of aquariums and things like that. But I sought to go into molecular biology, and um, my plan was to go into research. And after I finished college, this is another lesson about career plans. I actually worked at the University of Texas um, in, in, in the Department of Zoology. And after doing that for about a year, I realized that that kind of research, sitting in a lab, looking under the microscope all day, was, was very valuable work. It wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, I will say it was valuable because I worked on a um, on a grant from the Muscular Dystrophy Foundation, and our work focused on studying muscle cell development. So I think that that kind of work can benefit a lot of people if you're cut out to do it. But I recognized that I didn't want to be in a lab all the time, and go. that's when I started pursuing medicine. Okay. All right. So you're the state epidemiologist, but also the South Carolina's liaison with the CDC. Can you explain more about your job description? <clears throat> yes. So th there's only one state epidemiologist in each state. Okay. And that position, we work with our state health departments, but that position is also designated by the, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as the, the liaison or the key contact in the state for the CDC for um, certain information. Um, if we have to have communications with the CDC, they will send that information to the state epidemiologist to, to spread throughout the health department. Um, we also work as state epidemiologists, and with my counterparts in all the other states, we have regular meetings. And, we, um, and so we work together looking at, at nationwide plans for everything from doing uh, surveillance for diseases, working together to um, make decisions or make plans for preventing diseases. I happen to work in infectious diseases, but there are also, um, there's still only one state epidemiologist in each state, but there are also epidemiologists who, who specialize in everything from injury prevention, chronic diseases, environmental health. So epidemiologists work in a broad area, but that, that particular position and um, our um, contact with the CDC is sort of unique in each state. Okay, so now that we got a little background on who you are and where you came from, I kind of want to look towards the future. So if you could describe the fight of COVID-19 in just a couple of words, what would you call it? In the future? Yeah. Um, so Yasmin, you're asking such great questions, but I would say in the future, if I wanted to say a few words about it, I, I would like to be optimistic that we have the tools to make this go away. Okay. That we in the future can return to what we've been calling uh, some semblance of normalcy, getting back to when we didn't have to pay a lot of attention to being six feet apart <laughs> and we didn't have to have our masks all the time. But. Um, COVID-19 is having a dreadful impact on every aspect of our society, schools, um, the economy, all of these things that are actually secondary to the health effects. And so I would say in the future that I, that I have an understanding from a, from a disease control perspective, what we can do from a population to, to put an end to this pandemic. Um, but these are things that we just need everybody to pay attention to, to consistently practice, to take advantage of things that are available to us, like the vaccine, when it's available for people, that, that these are things that we have within our control to make the pandemic go away. Okay. So, you know, I'm a student, so I just, what, what are one things that students, you know, teenagers can do to kind of help against this fight? Um, I think the interesting thing about teenagers is they may be more socially conscious than their, um, 
than their parents, than their elders. I think that um, teenagers shouldn't miss the opportunity to use their voices to influence practices in the community. I know teenagers are, are probably much more active in, in environmental concerns and recycling and things like that. But in disease control, I think teenagers can have a bigger role than they think they do in influencing other people, but also in recognizing how their own behaviors affect other people. So when they're taking for granted that they don't have to practice safety measures or that they may say, um, as I mentioned earlier, that a lot of people may not even have effects from COVID-19, so they may have the perception, well, it's not going to really hurt me. But, um, but you don't know who it will hurt and who it won't hurt. So it's, it's sort of a gamble. Any one person is taking a risk that they themselves can be affected. But even if they're not affected, being socially conscious is really important and understanding how your behavior affects other people. So that if you think that you're not personally at risk, if you wear a mask, if you, if you avoid gatherings and things like that that public health officials are saying are, are risky, then I, I would like teenagers to pay more attention to how their behaviors affect themselves and how they affect others, how they affect the population as a whole, and how, um, how your generation can really help us move out of this pandemic. We need the teenagers to use their influence and practice those behaviors to help us all. Yeah, it's nice to hear we're useful instead of, you know, in a classroom sitting there. Yeah. All right, so as far as being an African-American woman, you know, being as a role model and being a mentor for younger adults, how does that make you feel? Um, I, I guess it, it brings about a lot of different emotions. I will have to say um, that, that a sense of pride is one of them because I, I, think, um, I think that the, this COVID pandemic has brought to light a lot of things about health disparities, a lot of things um, about how this disease is disproportionately impacting African Americans. So I, I guess I have a certain, maybe pride is not the right word, but, but um, a certain amount of influence to maybe change things for African Americans to help bring more attention to that, that there's more that we can do to get rid of some of these health disparities, that if any one good thing can come out of COVID-19. It's, it's a recognition of how there are, are, are many underlying things that are affect, affecting communities of color that we can do something about. So as an African-American woman, I think that I find myself in a position of perhaps having more influence over changing some of these longstanding issues in African-American populations. And if you could like talk to like a big crowd, what would you say? With regards to? With regards to growing up and fighting against some of the cutbacks in the healthcare system, sometimes what people think and how you progress through. Well, I think it's, it's, it's still going to be a struggle. Um, I'll use the word optimism again. I think that, that we all have to pay attention to the fact that you asked me questions about my role, but I think each and every one of us can assume a role, can assume a leadership position, that did you, you get to define whether or not you're a leader if you get people to follow you <laughs> and by setting an example. And so I, I think every one of us has maybe a similar opportunity that I have to, to, to take an opportunity to use some sort of influence, to sort of grasp that opportunity and turn it into um, to some greater potential. That, that each and every one of us has that opportunity within us, and I wouldn't want anybody to miss that. Okay. And one last question for you. What does it mean to be stay SC strong? What does that mean to you? Um, that's, that's kind of a, a, a maybe a tagline that, that others have used. I, I think it's important for us to recognize as, as a state that that we all sort of share, we share similar circumstances, we also have different circumstances, but there are, are certain things that, that should unite us all. And that if we say stay SC strong, that can mean different things to different people, but I think maybe the message that I would like people to get out of that 
is that we can look at um, we can look at both diversity and unity, and we can take advantage of all of our differences, but we can still come together. And as if, if we're looking at it from a state perspective, from SC Strong, that we should all use all of our strengths to for the benefit of all. Wow, that was great. Honestly, it has been a pleasure talking to you today. I get to go back and tell my friends, oh my God, y'all, I talked to Dr. Linda Bell. Oh my God. But thank you for coming out and sharing with us your experience, answering some questions for us. Honestly, thank you. Well, thank you for asking those questions. I'm so impressed uh, with, your, with your poise and you've asked such thought-provoking questions. And it's really been a pleasure to meet you too. I, I know that you have a bright future and I, um, I'm just really excited for you. Thank you.